Hi everyone, so welcome back to Shifting the Conversation. Uh, this week we have with us Emily Loy. Um, Emily Loy was a born and raised in Wichita, Kansas and obtained her Bachelor's of Arts in Art History from Wichita State University. After graduating, Loy obtained her Master's of Letters in Art History, Dress and Textile Histories from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. In November of 2018, she graduated and moved back to Wichita, where she enrolled back at WSU for a graduate certificate in museum studies, which she completed in December 2019. Presently, she is working towards another graduate certificate in nonprofit management. While obtaining her master's in Scotland, she took her long-standing love for modern theory and applied it to her knowledge of Scottish 18th century dress within portraiture thus developing a thesis that not only promotes the value of theory in the field of art history, but emphasizes the importance of working interdisciplinary. All right, welcome, Emily. I'm excited Hi. to talk. Hello. Let's get to this, I suppose. Hello. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And you get to see my beautiful presentation. Oh, gosh, that is all right. Okay, so hi, um, I guess let's just get started. This presentation is a brief synopsis from my master's thesis and research titled A Theoretical Application of Roland Barthes Semiotic Methodology to Tartan Depicted in 18th Century Portraiture, post-1746. First, let me begin by stating that I decided to conduct this theoretical experiment in hopes that Roland Barthes' methodology would ultimately answer two questions. What is the significance of the tartan depicted in these portraits? And what would this significance tell researchers through the use of semiotic analysis in way of identity within Scottish Highland dress and tartan at this time within the 18th century? This presentation aims to promote the value and continued application of semiotic theory within the field of dress history. Dress has the ability to depict human creativity and the social expectations that surround the wearer. Also, dress is embedded with a multitude of meanings, whether it be cultural, political, or self-identifying. It becomes an act of communicative function. Semiotic theory, in turn, can be used to interpret these meanings. Perceiving, eyewitnessing, and interpreting dress are actions that people take part in every day, oftentimes subconsciously. These observational acts are ways of interpreting information, such as a person's apparel or their overall appearance. When a person views the individual within their contextual surroundings and analyzes the situation for information, they are participating in a type of semiotic analysis. The same may be said for the interpretation of dress within portraiture. So what exactly is semiotics? What we know as contemporary semiotics was keyed by French semiotician and linguistic and linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. For Saussure, semiotics is a study of how people make meaning through both linguistic and non-linguistic ways. It is the philosophical theory concerned with understanding how people use signs and symbols in meaning making. He defined the sign essentially as the relationship between the signifier, that which carries or produces meaning, the physical existence of the sign, and the signified, the meaning itself or the mental concept. The ongoing study of Tartan during the time of the Jacobite Rising and the Battle of Culloden bears testament to the lasting power to human creativity and the meaning of dress within history. Research relating to Scottish antiquity and Highland dress govern much of the literature of Scottish sartorial identity. However, the role of tartan within portraiture depicts a broader scope of multi-layered imagery and meaning outside of purely historical studies. By using semiotics, the individual's investigation is brought in to incorporate information regarding not just the tartan depicted, 
but the sitter and the subject, the artist, and the scene as well. While four portraits were chosen for my analysis from the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, for the sake of time, I will present about one. So let us begin by addressing who is Roland Barthes and why does he matter? Roland Barthes was a French semiotician and theorist. Barthes had created a considerable body of work during the 20th century, which included topics relating to various semiotic codes of fashion through forms such as material culture, photography, and language. For Barthes, fashion or dress is considered a system that generates meaning, much like language, which in my personal opinion, made him an ideal candidate for my research. Barthes, like Saussure, argues that the meanings attributed to an image are in no way self-evident and universal. He furthers this argument by stating that cultural association is not a complete determinant, although it provides a link to the meaning and understanding of an image during that interpretation process. In other words, Barthes believes that no image can be judged, imagined, or interpreted in only one way based off of only one aspect of that image. It needed to be looked at holistically. This argument can largely be found in his essay, Rhetoric of an Image, written in 1964. His essay may not seem like the most apparent methodology for interpreting dress within the field of art history, as his primary example that validates his entire theoretical argument was an advertising image of pasta sauce and not dress related at all. However, once we work past the sauce and onto the theory, the semiotic methodology presented within, it, within his essay provides a form of interpretation that can be expanded onto the place of portraiture. And subsequently, the tartan depicted within it becomes front and center. Barthes believes, much like his structuralist forefathers, that in order to understand the significance of a singular element, it must, it must first be placed into the structure in which it is part. Now imagine, the portrait within the presentation works as a clock while the elements of dress and tartan depicted within each portrait are the cogs and gears. The elements of dress depicted within the portrait must be analyzed together to provide meaning for the entirety of that portrait, i.e. the clock is not actually a clock without its cogs and gears working together first. Through this methodology, one should keep in mind that it is possible to develop multiple meanings for each portrait depending on how each element of tartan dress is interpreted. Within his essay, Barth provides readers with three steps, or as he calls them, messages, as a means of interpreting an image, in our case, a portrait. These are the linguistic message, words associated with the image, the denoted image, literal or iconic message, and the connoted image, symbolic or non-iconic message. The linguistic message is any and all accompanying text or captions with the image. This message can then potentially be broken down into two parts, the denotational message and the connotational message. The denotational message is an initial analysis of the text, questions like, what language is it written in? is there a description of the image available, are proposed by the viewer. The connotational message that then um, takes the text associated with the image and asks a more symbolic question, such as, does the text or object label signify meaning or a deeper association with the image? The second message, the denoted image, is what can be known as the pure image or the image analyzed without the text associated or considered at all. 
The viewer observes and records the image's elements, objects, and compositions at face value. The final message, connotation, is the knowledge held within the viewer's perception. Therefore, the viewer's perception and knowledge combine with the linguistic message and the, and the denoted message to create a larger cultural and symbolic message regarding the image. Note, due to the nature of the methodology, every connoted image and its correlating questions may vary depending on the viewer's interpretation. Thus, the results of interpretation for one image is essentially endless. No two people see things the same way. So, does this make Barth's methodology pointless or does it make it infinite? You decide. The portrait for McDonald, Jacobite heroine, was chosen because of its depiction of a significant figure within the aftermath of the Battle of Culloden, which was the final battle of the Jacobite uprisings in Scotland that led to an English victory and ultimately the loss of Scottish independence. While most portraits of this period depict powerful men, this work is notable for its depiction of a seemingly ordinary woman wearing tartan. In keeping with Barth's semiotic methodology for visual images, this portrait is first analyzed for its twofold linguistic message. The linguistic message is any and all text connected with the image. The first step within the twofold message is to interpret the denotational message. The text of the object label displayed next to the portrait within the gallery and on the PowerPoint below the image states the title of the portrait, the artist Richard Wilson, the medium oil on canvas, and the data was painted 1747, and the data was purchased 1931. Some historiographical information is also provided. Flora MacDonald famously helped Prince Charles evade capture in the aftermath of his defeat at Culloden. With the prince disguised as her maid, they left Bambecula with a small boat just as the militia were closing in. Charles was eventually rescued by a French ship. Flora, meanwhile, was arrested and taken to London where she was placed under house arrest until the general amnesty for Jacobite prisoners in 1747. This portrait was painted for a young naval officer on the ship, which took Flora south. Both he and his com commander, Commodore Smith, made sure Flora was treated well. She became something of a celebrity in London, and this image explicitly identifies Flora in her white, beribboned tartan dress as a Jacobite heroine. The text very clearly answers the question, what is this? At even this early stage in the analysis, the viewer is able to gather direct information relating to the portrait as well as interpret that information. Other less obvious texts may also fall into this denotational category. These include the greater textual context surrounding the portrait, both in the gallery and through historical research. The portrait of Flora is located in the Jacobite Gallery as part of the permanent exhibition Imagining Power, the visual culture of the Jacobite cause. This portrait is displayed alongside all male portraits in the warrior print section of the room. There's basic historiographical information provided relating to Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Jacobites, and the Battle of Culloden. Also found within the text is a basic timeline dating from 1744 to 46, not presented on the PowerPoint, and the time Charles was in France until the time he left Scotland, also not pictured. This denoted information surrounding the portrait lays the framework for more connotational questions as a means of interpretation. How does the object label relate to the information on the group text? Why is this important? How does the text relate to the overall image? And finally, how does the text relate to the tartan depicted? 
These questions lead the viewer to analyze the connotational message found within the greater linguistic message. What is interesting about this part of interpretation and analysis is that the viewer is not expected to have much, if any, prior historical knowledge or background in the text surrounding the portrait. Therefore, the connotational message for this portrait is established through the relationship of the text to image and the text to the viewer, i.e., what do you see? The object label for the portrait of Flora describes her as a key figure in how Prince Charles escaped. It also provides the date in which the event occurred. The object label works to provide historical background to how this portrait came about, as well as demonstrates Flora as a Jacobite heroine. There's also a direct reference to the chart and dress that Flora is wearing. It is key, however, that at this point in the analysis, any speculation relating to further understanding of that tartan must be suspended so that no steps are taken out of order. The second message or step is the denoted image. When looking at the portrait of Flora McDonald, the first aspect that catch the eye is the contrast between the subject within the painting and the stark background. The light deriving from the upper center left of the portrait develops soft form shadows on the parts of Flora that are not directly in the light, creating depth within the piece. Her hair is dark in color and pulled away to frame her face, her cheeks rose color. She is wearing a set of red and black, creating a tartan dress with a white shift or chemise underneath. The viewer can see clearly the silver-like colored bows running down the front of her bodice, along with one bow per sleeve. She is also wearing a white rough choker necklace around her neck, while she is sitting bust length and full face towards the viewer. Bordering her within the dark colored background is the depiction of a fictive oval frame that is painted to appear like real wood. These artistic devices work to place Flora's dress, the most colorful aspects of the portrait, to the fore. This simple identification and denotation of colors, shapes, and recognizable objects allows the viewer to interpret the the painting solely based upon those observations. While paintings, much like drawings, are rather transformative in nature, it becomes clear that the viewer is meant to perceive a young woman with prominent features and a very deliberate choice of dress. Questions are then posed to further the analysis to the connoted image. These questions may vary depending on what the viewer takes away from the denoted image. However, in this case, for this particular analysis, a few of the questions posed may include, why is it imperative that Flora is depicted as full facing? Why is she wearing tartan in the first place? And does this have significance to the linguistic message already known about the portrait? Why is she depicted wearing tartan after the act of parliament, which prohibited the wearing of tartan in public, was already passed? As a reminder, while these questions are valuable and posed in hopes for answers, Barth's methodology makes it clear that it is the relationship of these questions to the portrait that are significant, as opposed to the answers they may provide. Given what is provided by the linguistic message, as well as the aspects of the portrait analyzed through the denoted image, the connoted image may develop. This is where the linguistic and denoted aspects of Flora's portrait meld with the knowledge acquired by the viewer. Some questions may not have a direct answer, if one at all. It is possible that Flora is depicted full facing to the viewer so, that, so as to be depicted as a strong and intelligent female figure who wanted to be viewed as have done nothing wrong. Due to the historiographical information written by scholars regarding the Jacobite cause and the object label, it becomes clear that there is a connection between Flora and the Jacobite cause. 
she could be depicted in tartan as a means of showing her affiliation and social standing as a polite woman in Scottish society. As the portrait was painted after the Act of Parliament was passed, as well as being a gift to an English naval officer, it is possible that there could be a bit of humor within the portrait. She might have wanted the officer to know that no matter what, she was proud of her Scottishness and will always have Jacobite support regardless of what happened to her. So now that the portrait has been analyzed to a great extent, what exactly can be concluded? Is this methodology a valid way to eyewitness and interpret dress within portraiture? Do we stop there? Well, what I have to say is this. The methodology presented by Roland Barthes in his essay, Rhetoric of the Image, once expanded upon to include portraiture, does in fact provide an alternative approach to how dress within portraiture may be interpreted. As mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the act of eyewitnessing and interpreting surroundings and objects is one done frequently and subconsciously. However, the semiotic methodology breaks down such observational and interpretive acts into extremely detailed steps, thereby allowing the viewer who would otherwise instinctually interpret the portrait to become hyper aware of their thoughts and more intentional in their interpretation. You may have noticed that Barth's methodology, like the sword before him, does not focus on the concluding answers to the questions developed. Rather, he highlights the value and importance of the relationship that develops between the signifiers, the linguistic message and the denoted image, and the signifies, the connotation within each portrait. This highlighting exemplifies that the theoretic, theoretical approach to dress may in fact offer a new set of questions towards the subject being researched. While Roland Barthes' semiotic methodology and theory is valid, it cannot stand alone. A reflection upon Barthes' method may include that because it is so preoccupied with the development of the question, an answer is not entirely taken into consideration. Therefore, the viewer must look towards other disciplines if a final answer is actually desired. Barth's methodology was applied to this research in hopes to provide insight relating to question one, what is the significance of the tartan depicted in these portraits and what could the significance tell researchers through the use of semiotic analysis in way of identity within social Scottish Highland dress and tartan at the time of 18th century. The method continues to bring forth further questions relating to the identity and the role of tartan depicted within portraiture post 1746. Although the application of Barth's method provides a new way of eyewitnessing the tartan, there is no definitive conclusion to be had if the analysis were to, were to end with Barth's connoted image. Consequently, it leaves an incomplete body of questions relating to the tartan depicted at all. Nevertheless, it can be argued that while the theoretical methodology used within this study is not entirely concerned with the answers relating to identity and the tartan depicted within the portraiture, it does set the stage for those answers to thus be provided. Ultimately, Barth's semiotic methodology provides the viewer and researcher with a theoretical pathway of interpreting and questioning dress within portraiture. During the final steps of, steps of Barth's methodology, the answers to these interpretations and questions are then left up to the viewer to discover through other disciplines if so desired. This aspect does not detract from the validity of the methodology used or any other theoretical approaches. Thus, further emphasizing on the importance of interdisciplinary approaches to the field and its research.
Thank you so very much. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I love semiotics and how it offers uh, exploratory methods of research and absolutely. It, yeah, just validity from different viewpoints and just opens the conversation for a lot of different researchers. I think it's great. It definitely breaks down the way you see things into microscopic aspects, which can be very time consuming and also exhaustive, but it can make you see details that you never would have thought before. So, yeah, absolutely. Very... Yeah, I agree. What made you um, kind of get started within uh, dress and portraiture and also tie in semiotics? I'm wondering where that kind of began. You can blame Professor Lockhart for semiotics. <laughs> that is all her. Um, I took her theory class as an undergrad at WSU and um, I fell in love. I just fell in love. Um, I've always had a very deep love and interest for dress and textiles. And being in Scotland, where my advisor's focus was 18th century dress, um, it just tied in very nicely to harness her knowledge and mix it in with the knowledge I've obtained for a previous advisor. It worked very well to combine my two lives. <laughs> That's awesome. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you presented this research other places? Um, I have. I've presented it at um, a conference at the University of Glasgow. Um, and that is where I got a lot of um, academic feedback from professors and other students who were studying very similar topics. So it just helped me grow and further develop my research. That's awesome. Yeah, I was curious because I know like semiotics offers limitless options to analyze your work. And so I know that each time it gets reviewed or edited by yourself or other persons that it just yeah. builds on it. something different. Yes. Always. Absolutely. I spent numerous hours in front of that portrait in the actual gallery. And every time I would show up to the gallery, I would notice something different, which is great, but also a little counterproductive when you're trying to write a paper where there's a deadline. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm thankful that the image is on um the gallery's website so i'm able to access it to continue to examine it and grow from it but yeah when there's a deadline you need to stop noticing things yeah definitely yeah i'm really interested to see if um other people will comment on this and what their opinions on analyzing not only dress within portraiture but people wearing dress and how that maybe influenced first impressions which is also kind of a subject area i'm interested in going into so we'll see we'll see what the dialogue brings yeah no i think it's there's i mean definitely comparisons you can make to analyze dress in portraiture in that era but then also i mean our current stand or situation whether that is first impression at job interviews or even like being very contemporary looking in like the public i'm thinking like during this pandemic who is wearing protective gear who is not who is taking things seriously and what does that oh, say yeah. about individuals or who does what does that say about um the person making those observations I exactly like what that. is your own personal bias and does that play into your observation and it, it, it's limitless it can go on and on and i think that is why semiotics is so interdisciplinary because yes it's great for art history and dress history but you can bring it into sociology and psychology and so forth absolutely i love it big proponent oh i love Semiotic. And who doesn't love a, a nice middle-aged man smoking in every picture? I mean, who right. doesn't love that? Thanks, a, Yeah, it really does. 
every theoretical art historian I have seen pictures of, I'm pretty sure he's sitting there smoking, contemplating life. Always in a lounge chair, always with a pipe in hand. Always. That's just and prerequisite of the position. It, it really is. And although I know we're trying to step away from that kind of stereotype, it's a very beautiful thing when you go back and research it because it's almost iconographical. Like it, they become these seminal beings. Oh, yeah. Study. It's oh, kind okay. of comical. They all look the same. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and they're all European for some reason. Right. All of them. Yes. Um, I'm curious, what uh, what kind of field do you want to take? Where do you want to go with this research? I know you were um, getting your degrees in our history, but I've also been working to get certificates in sort of like the museum studies world. Um, so I was just curious if you have a particular interest yeah. or any goal. Yeah. So... Ultimately, I'd love a PhD, and some current research that I'm doing, it's still in the very baby stages, because I haven't been able to travel to where a lot of these portraits are, is um, the Wish for Art Museum has a particular portrait that I absolutely love, and it's of a woman in 18th century dress, definitely worth a peruse, and um, that particular artist, Robert Feek, was a colonial American artist. And he painted these prominent, wealthy women of the New England colonies all in the same dress. Hmm. And so I'm interested to see if it was intentional because these women would have gone to each other's dinner parties. They knew each other very well, more than likely. Um, they were all so high up in society they even lived in the same city most of them so i'm kind of doing that research and analyzing the dress and possibly how the dress may have been constructed if it was in his mind or maybe he owned them in their costumes and why is that important so it's still in the early stages but i'm very fascinated by it yeah that sounds really interesting excited to see where you go with that yeah, absolutely, and hopefully a PhD will bring some out of that interest, <laughs> but we'll see this time. Yeah, absolutely, all the time in the world. The I just want to say thank you for participating, thank you for uh, being a part of this series, and I appreciate your research, your insights, and yeah. excited to see where you go, and what comes next. Thank you, I'm really thankful you appreciate it, semiotics. So. Can't get enough of it. You can't. Because it never leaves. Yeah. Always continue. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to listening to all the other programs that you have going for this. Yeah, we'll be seeing you soon. Yeah, it's going to be great.